not so much about the soap bubbles, actually, because I actually know why it's called the brown. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, I'd like to talk about some simpler models for which we can do some analysis and uh, hopefully you know, approach the soap bubble idea. Um, So, um, I guess, you know, if you talk about this, as, or what we learned in physics is that so bubbles, uh, so films in general, uh, like to minimize their surface area or uh, subject to some constraints, like a soap bubble has to contain a certain amount of air, uh, it's going to try to minimize its surface area subject to having a particular volume, and uh, there, therefore, you know, you can prove mathematically that the sphere, the round sphere is the shape uh, which uh, minimizes the surface area for fixed volume. On the other hand, uh, okay, well, before I get to you on the other hand, uh, if you take a soap, just another picture of a soap film uh, with, with a wire frame boundary. So instead of being constrained to enclose a certain volume, it's just constrained to uh, span a given, uh, in this case, a knotted curve in uh, space. And uh, it's going to form some more complicated shape, of course, uh, but it's still going to satisfy the local uh, uh, constraint that the, it, minimizes, it, it, it minimizes the surface area uh, among all surfaces with, with a particular boundary conditions. Well, that's what we learned from physics, or that's what physicists tell us. Uh, so bubbles minimize the surface area. Uh, on the other hand, well, okay, subject to the constraints like either imposing volume or uh, spanning a particular curve or some combination of these. Uh, uh, of course, the big question is, is why? And in one sense, is this a satisfactory explanation of what's going on in this soap film? Um, after all, uh, if you could look at a soap bubble, you know, under a microscope, uh, it's not at all a, a nice, uh, smooth object. In fact, you know, each, each little soap molecule is, is wandering around in some random fashion. You know, the surface locally is, is vibrating and fluctuating in various ways. Uh, it's, not a, it's not at all clear how the, the local uh, structure of the soap, how does one soap molecule on one side of the soap bubble communicate with the soap molecule on the other side to uh, decide to minimize the surface area. Right? So this is this is the kind of problem that, that uh, you know, bothers me. <coughs> and hopefully it bothers you as, as well. Uh, in fact, uh, as I was thinking about this talk, it's, it's, it's a funny thing about a soap bubble that uh, they, uh, if you try to make a soap bubble which is, is fairly large, I mean, I'm sure you've all done the experiment, if you make one which is, you know, more than like uh, a gallon <laughs> or something, <laughs> it, it's not round, right? It's a, it's a, it's a oscillates back and forth, uh, you know, because of the air currents and stuff. It's kind of an amazing thing, I think, that uh, soap bubbles live on this, are around on the same scale as human beings, right? If you make a slightly larger soap bubble, it's no longer around. If you make a very small soap bubble, it's almost perfectly a sphere. You can't see any records, uh, any contributions. Uh, you know, that, that's not the... Uh, well, so the idea that, uh, which I want to uh, get, get, get across in the talk is that uh, somehow uh, we're getting some global order, this, this large, nice, smooth shape uh, uh, from a uh, sort of local randomness. The, the individual soap bubbles are uh, only sort of interacting with their neighbors at most. Uh, and, and yet uh, somehow we just these local fluctuations are, are creating this global order. And I want to sort of understand that uh, phenomenon. Okay, uh, so uh, in probability theory, there's this uh, thing called the law of large numbers. Uh, and uh, this is at least part of the explanation of what's going on in the soap bubble. Uh, uh, what is the law of large numbers? Well, uh, what it says is it's a law of large numbers of experiments. One um, sort of statement of this is that, that if you uh, repeat the same experiment 
uh, many, many times over, over and over again, even though the outcome of e each experiment may be somewhat random, uh, on average, the, the, you're going to see some average behavior if, if, if you take an average over a large number of experiments. And the typical example, of course, is that if you just toss a fair coin uh, uh, many times, you get you know, a bunch of each, 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 the outcome of each toss is either a head or a tail. And you, you know, measure the total proportion of heads and tails, of course, uh, as the number of coin tosses, which are all independent of each other, uh, gets large, then the proportion of heads gets closer and closer to the hand. Right? So that's, that's uh, uh, sort of the most basic statement of this law of large numbers. Uh, and so in some, well, in some sense, you can think of this as a sort of a baby example of the case where, uh, even though, you know, if you look at the sequence at any particular uh, uh, part of that sequence, you, you see some random behavior. Uh, on the other hand, there's some sort of large-scale average behavior, which is, which is very smooth in the sense that, that it's getting closer and closer to the half uh, as, as, uh, as, as your averaging window gets larger and larger. Okay, well, um, uh, this is, of course, a very nice uh, uh, phenomenon in probability, but uh, I think more is going on in this uh, soap bubble than just this uh, law of large numbers. For one thing, uh, if you think of each soap molecule acting on its own, uh, the, the soap mo molecules are not independent of each other, so you can't think of them as sort of acting, each soap molecule acting independent of the other ones. It, it, uh, there are some uh, local uh, correlations between this, the action of so-called soap molecules. And so uh, really, uh, I want to sort of uh, have some sort of souped up version of, the, of this law of large numbers, some more general principle, which uh, can be stated roughly as follows, that the uh, nature works in such a way as to maximize randomness. And, uh, of course, I have to explain what I mean by this. But uh, if, if you just look at if you look at that phrase, it looks a lot like the second you know, principle of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. Just that nature tries to maximize it or maximize it. Um, now, uh, so. To understand uh, the connection between this and my, my soap bubble again, I'm going I'm to do a, baby, a, a different example, a slightly more complicated example than the coin tosses, but still uh, fairly s uh, simple uh, that we can analyze, so that we can analyze it. So let's talk about partitions. Uh, so uh, what's a partition? Uh, you take a, your positive integer n. Uh, and a partition is a way to write n as a sum of smaller numbers, and uh, you, you're going to write the sum n's in decreasing order. And so, uh, uh, for example, if I if, if I want to look at the partitions of four, there are five possible partitions of four. I can write four as just four, or three plus one, uh, two plus two, and so on. So I always write the sum n's in, in uh, weakly decreasing order, and uh, you know, the number of different ways I can do that is uh, uh, some function p of n, and p of four is five. Uh, and you can make a picture, a, a diagram of a, of a partition called a uh, Ferrer's diagram or Young diagram, uh, and it's just a, a sort of a histogram of the partition. Uh, you know, uh, in this case, you or, or you think of it as a stack of squares uh, in, the, in the positive orthant there. So the first column is the first, uh, the height of the first column is the first element in your partition, the height of the second is the second element, and so on. And the total volume, the total number of squares is the is the n for which this is a partition of n. So, okay. Uh, so, okay, partitions were, were uh, studied you know, classically, a very simple uh, kind of combinatorial object, and uh, but they're very important in many parts of mathematics, in particular representation theory, where they have to where they have to do with you know, pure useful representations of the symmetric group. I'm not going to get into any of that uh, stuff. But uh, Euler uh, was the first to sort of uh, study the number of partitions of, of an integer n. Uh, and 
you make this uh, generating function here, so p of x is the, uh, the you, it's, a, it's a power series where the p coefficient is the number of partitions of k. Uh, so it starts out like this, the number of partitions of 0 is 1, the number of partitions of 1 is 1, the number of partitions of 2 is 2, and so on. Well, Euler gave this nice, uh, nice uh, formula for the number of partitions of, for, for, the, for the generating function p of x, which is the product of uh, 1 over 1 minus x to the j, j going from 1 to infinity. Um, and the proof is actually quite simple. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you write down uh, each of these, if you expand each of these things as a geometric series, think of x as being less than 1 here. Expand each as a geometric series, uh, as I've done here, then uh, when you uh, expand out this infinite series and collect the terms, uh, if, if I, for example, uh, if I take the x3 term here, and the x squared term there, and the x6 term there, and then all, all the remaining terms are all ones, and what I see is that I'm going to get x to the power of 11, uh, 6, yeah, 11, and uh, the, the the x cubed in the first factor, I can think of that as having that has three ones. The x squared in the second factor is one, two, and the x sixth, is the second is the, well, is the, this is the third entry in the third factor, so it corresponds to having two threes. So this is zero threes, one three, two threes, and so on. So uh, to each, uh, uh, to each way to collect, uh, to, to select the term from each of these uh, uh, products, the terms are eventually going to be 1 if I can have some finite power of x. Uh, I can associate a partition. Alright, so when I, when, I, when, I, when I sum this over all possible choice, choices, I, I of course get this, uh, this product. I'm going to get the sum of x to the n, uh, and the coefficient is going to be the number of partitions of x. Alright, does that make sense? Good. <laughs> I got one now. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so, so you can actually analyze. It, it's it's not super easy to analyze uh, how this grows at uh, n gets large, but it can be done. This is the leading order magnitude uh, of that. Well, uh, there's other fun identities you can you can, uh, you can play the same game with some very similar looking products. Uh, here, this is just you know for your own amusement. It has nothing to do really with the rest of the talk. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, if if I take a product like this, this is uh, if you look if you understand Euler's proof from the previous slide. Uh, if I if I want to expand this this product out in uh, power of x. I'm going to be counting partitions where uh, each uh, uh, the number of ones in my partition is either zero or one, the number of two is zero is zero or one, the number of three is zero or one. So the number of partitions is unequal parts uh, on the left. So this is going to be a generating function for the number of partitions is unequal parts. On the right hand side, well, if I write one plus x as one minus x squared or one minus x, uh, one plus x squared is one minus x squared or one minus x squared. So on. Uh, then uh, you see this one one minus x squared here is going to I can cancel out the numerator and the denominator there. And the one minus x to the fourth I can cancel out the term over here, and so on. So each each uh, factor in the numerator is going to cancel with one of the factors in the denominator, and you're left with only the odd factors in the denominator. Right? And we can interpret this product. It looks very similar to the to the product for partitions on the previous slide, but we've only got the odd numbers if you're in, in the denominator, so it, it counts the number of partitions into odd parts. So the, the, the well, for example, five, there's only three ways to, to partition it into odd numbers. You know, five, three plus one plus one, and all ones. And so this identity here is telling us that the number of partitions into unequal parts is equal to the number of partitions into odd parts. Not something which you know you might be hard pressed to prove uh, if you didn't know these generating functions. Right. Uh, and uh, well, okay. Uh, this is another uh, even well, slightly more complicated uh, statement. 
uh, involving the same kind of quantities, uh, you want to count the, if you want the power series for the triangular numbers, so the only exponents which, it, which occur are the triangular numbers, uh, you can also write this in a similar sort of, sort of way. And there's, there's sort of a combinatorial way to prove this, but uh, you know, it's not really the point of the talk, so I'm not going to tell you that. But, uh, Uh, the point of the talk is uh, we're, we're now uh, want to take n very large and consider what does a random partition of n look like when n is very large. So we, we, the, the previous uh, formula at least allowed us to count the number of partitions of n, but uh, we wanted more information. We want to know, you know what does it actually look like. Uh, at least you know if you graph it, what does the graph look like? So there's a picture uh, I made of a random partition of n. Uh, here's one uh, of 200 is one of 2,000. Um, it, it it, it's not maybe what you would have guessed the, the shape would look like, uh, but uh, well, there it is. So the question is, one question you might be asking is, as n gets large here, uh, is there some sort of a, a most likely shape, and how likely is that shape? Right. So you can see that the this is kind of like a two-dimensional soap bubble uh, phenomenon. We had this, uh, oops, we had this, you know, random uh, shape. You know, microscopically there's a lot of fluctuations, uh, but uh, if, if we step back from the picture, what we see is actually uh, a smooth curve. Right? If, if we make n very large. In fact, so uh, first you can cure up uh, proved in the 70s that uh, there's actually a, 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 what we would call a limit shape for this uh, uh, random partition. So you take a large uniform random, random partition, or, or a partition of n, with, you know, with uh, n uh, going to infinity, and then you rescale things so that the total area is fixed, like, uh, well, i squared over 6, or, or maybe you want to have area 1. Uh, then uh, with, with probability tending to 1, the, the shape is going to lie very, very close, and closer and closer as n gets large, to the particular, this particular smooth curve called the Bursic curve curve. And you know, they gave this formula, a very simple looking formula for that curve. All right, so in some sense, this is a, a, a so-called type phenomenon. We started with some random objects, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, in the limit where our molecules are extremely small, we see some smooth uh, shape in the limit. So there's no randomness left in the limit. Uh, in fact, here, here's the uh, simulation of a 2000, uh, area 2000 partition, uh, and with the curve superimposed on top. And you can see the fit is actually pretty good. going a curve like that. Every step is either east or east or to the south line. And 
has to lie in a particular neighborhood of, of this uh, straight line, something which is, is approximating a straight line if we zoom in far and close enough. And so if we want to count how many partitions lie near our favorite curve here, uh, 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 all we can do is uh, sort of uh, break this, our curve up into small pieces on which, and on each piece uh, uh, approximate our curve by a straight line on a particular slope. And so what we, what we need to do to count the number of partitions near this line is to estimate uh, how many partitions, uh, how many curves lie near a particular uh, straight line or a particular slope. And of course, we know how to do this. If, if, if I, at least if I fix the endpoints of, uh, of my, of my uh, broken line, my like here at 0, 0, and 19, comma, 11, or minus 11, to uh, how many, how many uh, broken lines are there? We start here and end up there. Well, this is just a binomial coefficient. Uh, you know, to draw a line uh, of this type going from the upper left corner to the lower right corner, I have to the line has total length 30, and I have to choose 19, 19 places where I go to the right and 19 where I, 11 where I go down. So the number of such lines is binomial coefficient 30 to the 11. Right? If I've got a, uh, a line of a, uh, if my line is very long now, uh, and, and and it has slope s, then the binomial coefficient, which is counting the number of partitions which lie near that line. Uh, looks like this, it's n choose n s over s plus 1. And so this is growing exponentially fast, exponentially in n, the length of the line, times some function of s of the slope. And that's the important function right there, uh, h of s. Well, what function is it? Well, uh, you probably know the Stirling's approximation to the, to the vectorial, which, which, uh, tough, which can, from which you can compute this function, h of s, which is, in fact, called the Shannon entropy. Uh, so going back now, if I want to compute the number of partitions lying here, up, up my favorite uh, curve, I'm just going to have to, uh, I chop my curve up into pieces where, where it's approximately linear, and then I uh, sum the entropies, the entropy times the local uh, unit of length uh, along that curve, and that will give me some estimation of the log of the number of partitions near that. Right. And so the conclusion is that, uh, well, uh, the Bursche Kirov curve is the one, is the, is the unique curve which actually maximizes this uh, entropy. It, it, uh, it maximizes the uh, number of nearby uh, broken curves. Well, among, all, among all curves, uh, well, which uh, start, start, start at some, uh, start, you know, which are increasing and have total volume, uh, you know, one underneath them, you look at the one which has the maximum number of partitions nearby, it is the Rishi curve. And in fact, uh, as, as, the, uh, as n gets large, the, uh, not only is the Rishi curve, curve the maximum, but it's, it's got overwhelmingly the majority of partitions nearby, in the sense that for any other curve, the, the asymptotic growth rate is lower. So that when n gets large, uh, the number of uh, partitions near the Bursic curve are uh, overwhelmingly dominates all the others. So that's why, uh, as n gets large, you only see that, that particular curve, that limit shape. So, so this limit shape is the, it, uh, it's not just the average shape, it's the a typical shape in the sense that the probability of seeing any other shape is going to zero. That's the... Uh, All right, well, uh, I want to uh, talk about the slightly more modern stuff, which is a three-dimensional version of this uh, partition problem. So we're getting closer now to the soap bubble, which is, after all, a three-dimensional object. So a three-dimensional uh, for every diagram of a well, three-dimensional partition, you could think of uh, it. Uh, this is a histogram of 
3 d partition. So it's just a, uh, a, a function uh, on the natural numbers, cross the natural numbers of total volume uh, n, and which is you know, de weakly decreasing in the x direction and in the y direction. So anyway, if you draw the graph of such a function, it looks like it's sort of a stack of boxes in a corner of a room, just like that, as illustrated. Well, uh, uh, if you want some sort of physical uh, interpretation, if you turn this picture upside down, uh, you can think of this uh, room as uh, sort of a, a corner of a big uh, crystal uh, cube, a, a big uh, cube, uh, and which, uh, which at the corner you, you remove a certain number of little subcubes. If you think of sort of taking a very large crystal of salt, salt atoms you know, are arranged on a cubic lattice, you dip your salt in your in, in, a, in, a, in your water briefly, in a cup of water briefly, and you pull, you pull your salt uh, crystal out again. A, a few of the salt crystals near the corners have dissolved away, if you like. Uh, the, the reason they dissolve near the corner before the edges is that near the corner, I mean, for example, this crystal, this. This this uh, this place here, this. Uh, molecule of salt it has only three neighbors in the salt uh, crystal, uh, whereas the ones along the corners have four neighbors, so they're more tightly bound than the ones near the corner, at the corner. So every, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and that one, they've only got three neighbors, whereas the ones outside here have either four neighbors that are on the corner or five neighbors that are on the edge. So these are the ones that we should dissolve away first, and so you get some sort of uh, rounding to the corners of your crystal. That's why it's called a crystal corner model. Uh, of course, salt doesn't actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is really a realistic model of a salt crystal, but uh, it is in some, in some limited low temperature. All right, well, how many uh, 3D partitions are there? Uh, uh, this this uh, is a much harder uh, question, uh, and you know, it was only solved sort of in the early 20th century. If you write up the, the generating function for 3D partitions, so we have P sub 3D of K. Uh, well, there's one with zero, there's one with one, there's three partitions with two blocks, six partitions of volume three, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, the, the formula is, is amazingly simple, even though the proof is quite hard. Uh, in, in fact, the formula resembles uh, uh, the formula of Euler in a remarkable way. <laughs> but, but the proof has nothing to do with it. I mean, the two proofs are, are, as far as I know, completely unrelated. And, uh, so McMahon, uh, in one of his papers, uh, claims to have a formula for 40 partitions and 5D partitions and so on, which generalizes this one, where you place the, the one, the next one is here by triangular numbers. But, but the, that, that, uh, he says he's going to prove this in a subsequent paper, but that paper never appeared. So it's actually not even true. <laughs> uh, it's, a, well, it's pretty hard to count 40 partitions, and I think you have to go several terms in the series before you see the discrepancy between the, the, the advanced purported formula and the for 40 partitions. And the actual formula. Anyway, this one is certainly correct uh, for 3D partitions. That's a very nice formula. And we're going to ask the same question again. What does a, what does a random uh, uh, large 3D partition look like? So here's a sort of a simulation, which I did like a computer of a, of, a, of a somewhat large, not very large <coughs> 3D partition. And again, you see that the looks like there's some, that it might be having, that there's, there's some sort of limit shape phenomenon. Yeah, and indeed, uh, that can be true. There's, there's again a, a limit shape phenomenon, and uh, you can draw, uh, there's a picture of the limit shape. You can actually write down an exact formula for the limit shape. Uh, somewhat more complicated. I, mean, I can't write it. In, I mean, it's hard to write it in sort of a closed form, but it, there's an easy integral uh, which describes that limit shape. So here's the limit shape over here in slightly different coordinates on the right. So, uh, so instead of the, the walls being sort of three walls of a room, if you slam the walls back by a linear transformation, in these coordinates, where, so this is the x 
x axis and the y axis here. And uh, this is just a graph of a function, r of xy, which is given by this double integral, complex uh, contour integral. There. But in, in any case, uh, you know, this integral is not so easy to, to evaluate, but it can be done sort of uh, using logarithms and dialogarithms. Fairly straightforward, uh, well-known function. And well, one kind of interesting thing, feature about this this shape is that uh, it has facets. This crystal, I mean, this 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 function when you draw it, it's it's actually zero uh, in this region. It has a slope one, exactly one here. It's linear in this region. It's linear in this region, and it's uh, you know analytic uh, on on the interior here. So it's only a piecewise analytic function. Even though it looks like it's a nice integral of a nice, perfectly analytic function here, it's actually only piecewise analytic. And the boundary between the, the places where it's linear and the places where it's curved uh, is are copies of this Rorschach curve from uh, one dimension lower. Okay. Some of mysterious uh, regions. regions. Well, so what's this picture over here? Well, if you remember the, the formula, the, the, the Shannon entropy formula, which played a role in the series, uh, the 2D partitions, there's a corresponding formula for 3D partitions, which, which depends now on two variables. In the sense of the, the here, S, here S was the slope in, in the plane. And when we're talking about 3D partitions, there's two slopes, the x slope, the slope in the x direction, the slope in the y direction. And you, that, that function h is, is, is replaced by this thing which I'm calling surface tension sigma, and that we're minus the surface tension, and that's a it's graph of something like that. Also, it's not a complicated problem. Okay, well, uh, one interesting feature of the three dimensional case is that uh, uh, you can impose other boundary conditions. I mean, you don't have to just consider a soap bubble, you can consider a wireframe. You know, you take your wireframe, you dip it in soap soap film, and you're going to get some minimal surface. Well, same th kind of thing happens in this setting. Uh, here, if I take a wire frame, which is a, which is a hex hexagon in R3, uh, in th three pieces of a three, you know, six sides of a cube in, in uh, R3. And you know, this, is, this is what a, a typical uh, uh, step surface is going to look like, which spans that wire frame. Now I'm not putting any volume constraint. I'm just considering all possible uh, surfaces which span that uh, frame. And, and if you like, you can think of this as just two, a two-dimensional picture. And it's just tilings of the, of the big hexagon by uh, thrombi of 60 degree angles, so 60 degree angles. I take a random tiling of a hexagon, n by n by n hexagon by rhombi. Uh, what does it look like? Well, it looks something like this. It is uniform range. And well, you can see that uh, even though I've chosen a uniform random tiling here, it, it, it definitely has some large scale structure, right? Near the corners, uh, you see only yellow uh, tiles down here. Over here, you see only pink. Over here, you see only blue. There's some region near the corners where, the, where there's, uh, there's these facets. Just like in the case of the, uh, 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 the color scheme is the same as, as, as here. You know, here, for the, for the 3D partition, there were some facets here which were where the where exclusion was linear. We see that some remnants of those facets here. And, and here's, a, here's a slightly larger simulation of with a different wire frame, an octagonal wire frame, and you know, we can see that these facets are persisting in the in the in the limit when the, the scale when the scaling of the lattice is going to zero. Well, okay. So to make a long story short, you, you can you can you can actually uh, uh, prove that there's a limit shape in this in this setting, some sort of minimal surface, uh, but not minimal surface for this in the standard sense, but minimal surface for this uh, 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 for this, uh, this sort of monotone step surface uh, model, and uh, in in the, in the limit the the, the 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 there are these facets. Which persist in the limit, and the boundary between the facets and the and the curvy part is is well, on this picture. It's going to be actually a cardioid. It's going to be an algebraic curve here, which is a cardioid. It's an arch. Cardioid is a 
degree four algebraic curve, which you get by uh, you know, spinning a, a circle, one circle around another uh, without slipping, and you follow uh, the locus of a point on, that, on, the, on the outer circle that it spins around and you get a cardio. Okay, so the limit shapes uh, which, uh, which appear in this uh, setting satisfy some complicated nonlinear PDE. Uh, which essentially is, you know, minimizing that surface tension, uh, just like in the case of the soap bubble. But uh, through some change of variables, you can reduce the PDE to a fairly simple PDE called the complex Bergeron equation, which looks like this. C is now a function of on the plane, the x and y plane, and it's a complex value function. X derivative of p plus p times the y derivative of p. Right. This is this is a something which can be solved using standard techniques from PDEs. And uh, that allows you to actually uh, explicitly write down the uh, solutions for various wireframe boundaries, in particular for the hexagon and the octagon here. We can get the exact the, the specific uh, particular solutions. Okay, so, and, and here's, um, here's kind of a fun thing, which I think is you know, one of the most uh, amusing or interesting uh, parts of the whole theory is that you can actually reconstruct the surface from its boundary. Here the boundary is this cardioid, which I talked about earlier. It's a place where outside the, outside the cardioid, the system is in these, uh, has these facets, and inside is a smooth curve. Uh, so here's a, here's a little uh, construction, which uh, you guys have will, will enjoy. If you take a point outside the cardioid, here, you can draw three, uh, the cardioid has three tangent lines going through this point, right? This one, this one, and that one. On the other hand, if you have a point inside the cardioid, no matter where you are inside, there's only one tangent line. Right? For example, through this point, the only tangent you can draw is that line there. So as you, as you take this point and you move it around, uh, when it crosses the boundary here, two of those tangents disappear, right? The tangents which, uh, you know, first of all, when it gets closer and closer, there's two tangents which become a double tangent there, and then when it goes inside, those two tangent lines disappear. But since it's an algebraic curve, they can't really disappear. What happens is they become complex. So a point outside here has three tangents, a point inside has like one tangent, one real tangent line. The other two tangent lines have become uh, complex tangent lines. So, uh, well, a tangent line looks, uh, you know, this is the equation of a line in the plane. If A1 and A2 are complex numbers now, uh, well, that's the equation of a complex tangent line. So this, this 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 real algebraic curve here has some uh, it, it's just the real part of some complex algebraic curve. Okay? So inside from a point inside you think of these two tangent lines going off somewhere into complex two space. But uh, anyway, if we draw the you, you break down the equation for that tangent line, uh, you get three complex numbers, a1x, a2y, and one, which sum to zero. And you can make a little triangle out of those three numbers. Right? One triangle in the complex plane, 1, A1x, A2y. And you click in triangle, and you look at the angles of that triangle, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. That gives you a, and you make a vector out of those, those angles. This is, the, this is the vector which is the normal to the, to the limit shape surface at that point. Right? This surface is some surface in R3, uh, and it's normal smooth surface and the normal at that point is, is given by this uh, vector. So you see what happens is that uh, when, when this point gets closer and closer to the boundary, uh, this triangle becomes closer and closer to a real triangle because A1x and A2y are becoming real. So one of the angles of that triangle uh, is going to pi and the other two angles are going to zero. So that means that the normal is, is starting to point in one of the three axis directions. And that's what you see in these pictures. When you get near the boundary, you get more and more pink, and eventually, when you cross the boundary, you only see pink, and then the normal is in you know, either the x direction or the y direction or the z direction, depending on what color you are. Okay. Well, that's all I have to say. I'd like to uh, thank the various co-authors which I worked with over the last 10 years on this kind of on this project.
have a quick break and there's going to be a poster session.